tonight we're here to talk about gardening and getting those gardens started. And with us we have Amrita Cottrell and Dennis Jackson. And they're going to talk about soil and what you need, how to do it, and everything that I don't know about. <laughs> but um, please welcome Amrita and Dennis. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the why, when, and how about soil. Soil, um, soil science is a huge study. And so we're hoping to um, condense it down, make it a little easier to understand. Dennis is going to do a lot of the talking tonight because he's the scientist. Um, I'm the one that plays around with the worms and, and gets my fingers down in there. He's, he understands the science much more than I do. But here we are, building your soil. Why, when, and how. So we're going to start off with um, something that's a little depressing. Um, this is an article that was actually written, if you can see it, it's a little blurry down at the bottom. This was written in 2014. And it came out in uh, uh, Reuters. <coughs> and it says, only 60 years of farming left if soil degradation continues. So that was nearly 10 years ago. So we're heading down to the 50 mark now. Um, it's sobering, to say the least. So it takes a 1,000 years to create 3 centimeters of soil naturally. This is not if you're making your own soil. This is what happens in nature. And um, we're losing soil at a very fast rate because of our, pra our, our agricultural practices, which is very sad. Um, it says here that a third of the world's soil has already been degraded. And 95% of our food comes from soil. So if we keep going in the direction that we're going, um, not only are we losing our pollinators, but we're also losing our soil. Here's a, here's a uh, quote that says, we're losing 30 soccer fields of soil every minute, mostly due to intensive farming. This is worldwide. So we're going to talk tonight about what we can do in our own yards to stop some of that. So here's an overview of what we're going to cover tonight. First section is what is soil and why to test it. To understand what soil is and what it needs. So unless you know what your particular soil in your yard needs, um, you aren't going to be as successful. If you do a soil test, Dennis is going to talk about this, it will tell you what your soil is lacking and what you need to to enhance it, to feed it. Um, to till or not to till? This is a big question. And we're going to go over the pros and cons of both. Why, when, and how to make soil? We're going to explore, explore soil making without going to the big box store and without buying the big bags and using a plastic that then gets thrown away. Um, next section is feed, water, and mulch the soil, discovering how to maintain good soil health. In the last section, we're going to talk about why is diversity so important. Understand why planting a diversity of plants promotes good soil health. That's what we're going to cover. Here's a wonderful quote from Wendell Berry from his book, The Unsettling of America. The soil is the great connector of lives, the source and the destination of all. It is the healer and restorer and resurrector by which disease passes into health, age into youth, death into life. Without proper care for it, we can have no community because without proper care for it, we can have no life. So there's our first section. What is soil? Soil contains organic matter which helps transport move and move water, 
provides homes for thousands of bacteria and other creatures. Soil can change over time depending on how it is fed and managed. So we will cover about that in this section. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dennis and let him walk you through it. All right, so what is the difference between dirt and soil? Um, one definition I've heard is dirt is soil that's out of place, but that's really not um, the case. Soil, like the last slide showed, is a living organism. It's a complex ecosystem where dirt is minerals, rocks, different sizes um, of sand and clay and silt. Um, there's some inorganic nutrients in there, but it doesn't have the life web that true soil does. So that uh, stuff that makes um, soil nice and dark, that good organic matter, um, that can be alive with thousands of different types of bacteria, fungi, nematodes, um, and um, kind of a bacteria, let's see, I always forget the name of this one, actinomyces. There's sort of a, a bacteria that's um, kind of got some fungi kind of characteristics to it, but it's still a bacteria. Um, and they decompose the organic matter and then other microscopic predators eat them and then other larger invertebrates start eating them and you get all this energy exchange happening in the soil. And why is that important for your plants? Well, those little bacteria that are feeding near the plant roots, when they get killed by their predators, they release all the nutrients they've been taking out of dead plant matter and turn it into a form that the plants can use and they dump it right by the plant roots. So the soil food web can feed your plants. Soil testing, so um, you got um, you got your basic uh, soil um, structure, which is you got sand, silt, and clay, and organic matter, and then um, various chemicals that are in the minerals form, um, you know, are what, what forms the basis for nutrients um, for the plants. And a soil test can tell you um, what kind of deficiencies you might have like whether you got uh, not enough magnesium or something like that. Um, and then in the soil test will also tell you pH. And you can, you know, you can test uh, soil pH with a little kit, but if you send a soil uh, sample off to a um, soil lab, they can not only tell you the pH, but they can assess what's called the buffering capacity of the soil. So soil has a mix of things like calcium and magnesium and other um, elements in it that when you put in something like lime, um, she, um, prevents the lime from just moving the pH um, in, uh, in towards a higher um, pH number. So I'll get back up. pH is a measure of the hydrogen ions in soil, and it's a measure of acidity or alkalinity. So small numbers on a pH scale are acid, and big numbers are alkaline. So like baking soda has got a big number, vinegar has got a small number. Okay. Um, and plants like to have the soil somewhere around, well, between six and seven is a broad range, okay? And, that's, and each number is a factor of 10. So seven is considered neutral, so six is 10 times as more acidic as seven. And five is 100 times as acidic as seven, okay? 
Um, yeah, let's see. Um, so um, the soil lab can tell you exactly what kind of um, nutrients to add to your soil to help um, feed your plants. And uh, let's see. Can the, so here's um, we sent in a sample of our soil this year, and Maine Soil Testing Service charges eighteen dollars for one of these tests. And it takes a couple of weeks from the time you send it to the time you get the answer back. Um, and you can see that um, there's a, a, on the little bars, there's a low, um, and boy, my, my glasses. It's, it's, yeah, yeah well, it's the, 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 the far one is optimum, uh, not the quite far one, but the, the last little box is above optimum, and then the, Oh, I guess that's medium. Oops, low, medium, um, optimum, and yeah. excessive. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Anne. A little excessive. Yeah, so you, you can see that uh, um, things like the green is like phosphorus and potassium, calcium, uh, magnesium. Um, those are hitting more or less in the optimum range. Um, the potassium a little on the high side. Um, and then down in the blue, we've got uh, iron and zinc that are going too far, um, way too much. But, um, you know, so that's a, a place where we can look at that and decide how to treat our soil. But, um, like the iron and the zinc are only a really a big problem for plants if it's in a really acid situation, like even maybe even more acid than you'd grow blueberries in. So a pH of like below 5.5. Um, and then, uh, you know, they give you a more detailed analysis down there. But, um, so here's the general idealized um, structure of soil about how you got inorganic uh, mineral matter of about 45 percent and 25 percent water and 25 percent air and then five percent of um, um, organic matter and um, the bacteria in that so we're talking about a big chunk like this you know and the bacteria and other food webs things tend to be somewhat concentrated towards the top because that's where the organic matter enters the soil and they start decomposing it. But over time there is bacteria down lower, but it, you find most of them up near the surface. Can you talk about that one? Sure. So this slide shows um, the synergy between the physical properties, the biological properties, and the chemical properties of soil, and how important it is that they all work together. Um, each one of these has its own certain properties, um, uh, its specialties, I guess you could say, uh, that help to bring the synergy into balance, creating healthy soil. We're going to go through these in, in more detail as we go along. And so here, here are those different properties and the things that, that they're made up of. So in the chemical area, and Dennis is going to go through these in, in much more detail. These are, just, these are just covering the basics. So chemical properties um, that is organic matter and pH, as he just spoke of, being acidic, neutral, and alkaline. Those micro and micronutrients, which are trace elements, and then nitrates and salinity. Those are factors that come to play in, in chemical properties of soil. And the physical properties, we're probably more familiar with these because these are the things that we can actually see. Soil color. So we'll have a slide that shows you all the different kinds of colors that you can have within your um, soil, but 
basically the color shows what the composition is and what the fertility is of your soil. It's not an exact science, but it's an approximation. Soil texture, so the three basic types of soil, being clay, silt, and sand, the components of soil. The structure, so we have the permeability, the porosity, and the aggregates of, uh, of soil. And then the soil horizon, which I'm sure you know if you take a cross section or if you dig your, your, um, your spade down into the soil, you'll see all these different levels. So you have the topsoil on the top, then you have the humus, then you have small rocks. Sometimes here in Maine, we have big rocks right up at the surface, but usually <laughs> it's the topsoil, the humus, the small rocks, and then you get down to where the bedrock is. And then we have the biological properties, which as Dennis said, is that or organic matter decomposition. Um, we have the soil organisms and the microbial support. And then those enzymes and bacteria and fungi and exudates, which really feed the soil. And, and then we have the diversity of the living organisms that, that help to um, round out those biological properties of soil. All right, so there's lots of different factors for the chemistry of soil. We've already talked about uh, soil pH, so that um, less than five and a half is for really, this is focused on plant growth, so this isn't the same um, view you'd have a pH if you're doing general chemistry. But for plant growth, um, you consider a soil acid if it's less than 5.5. And then optimal is around 6 to 6.8 or even, even 7. And alkaline being above 8. So 7 is neutral. Um, and when you're gardening, you don't necessarily need to think of having all your garden area having the same pH because, you know, you want your blueberries over here and your rhododendrons over here. And... Um, some other little flowers over there, and they all have their different pH requirements. So you just need to think about right in the vicinity of the plant, within the basic root zone of that plant, or where the, the plant might send its roots to, so maybe slightly larger than its existing root, root zone, okay? And soil pH, the pH of a system, of a lot of chemistry systems, um, governs the reactions that can happen. Um, like iron is pretty immobile until it's in an acid situation and then it'll um, start reacting with things. Um, so pH is kind of a background. It doesn't directly affect plants, but what it does is it um, it, it sets the stage, sets the condition for the chemical reactions that needed to feed the plant. And then organic matter, you know, plants decay and small animals and whatnot, um, invertebrates, um, they, when they die, um, the, um, bacteria and stuff start breaking them down and, and but all of plants in most life is made up of hydrogen and carbon and a lot of other stuff, but those are like those are the major th components. So hydrogen and carbon form your sugars and starches. So what your plant um, circulates around in its veins to feed itself is sugars. So carbon and hydrogen, and it builds its structure out of carbon and hydrogen with plus oxygen and it's taken in from the air. Um, so another thing about organic matter is it's got a lot of surface area and it has a surface charge, typically a negative charge, and it can hold on to a lot of things. Like uh, you may have heard of uh, activated carbon or charcoal filters for water and that's basically a form of organic matter. And it can bind to um, 
well, or let me put it the other way around, that pollutants in the water, if they have the right surface charge, will stick to the carbon and not get into your drinking water. So, um, like chlorine, chlorine will get attracted and, and stuck. Um, now, so you got macronutrients and micronutrients. So the, the big nutrients, the um, ones that plants need a lot of is like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And when you go buy a um, conventional fertilizer, it'll tell an NPK value about how much nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus are in that mix. And organic um, fertilizers will have the same information on it. And then you have um, micronutrients, which are needed in much smaller amounts, like uh, sulfur, boron, calcium, zinc, manganese. And then you also have salinity. So um, salinity can build up over time by um, salts in water that it, when water evaporates leaves salts behind like um, in arid land that's really a problem because you irrigate the field and then the sun evaporates the water and leaves a salt and after a while it, uh, it'll crust over and that's been the major cause of the decline of several civilizations in the Middle East like uh, the Sumerian Empire um, started falling apart because things got a little hotter and they'd been irrigating their land for hundreds and hundreds of years and then the salts started forming crusts and the production, uh, the food production went down and their society kind of fell apart because uh, the surrounding people are going, hey, <laughs> you've been, um, kind of been rough with us for a while so we're taking your toys away. Um, so salinity is, uh, can be a factor, but for most gardens, it's not, okay? Another thing that's important is nitrates. You know, nitrates come from decomposed plant re residues, animal manures, and fertilizers. And then, um, they feed plants directly, but microorganisms, like particularly fungi, can transform nitrates into ammonium, which your plants like even better. So they'll, it's a, a better grade of fertilizer for plants. So having fungi in your soil promotes the fertility of the soil because it makes the transfer from nitrates into ammonium. Now, physical properties of soil affect the infiltration rate, so erosion, and nutri nutrient cycling, and biological activity. So physical properties of soil, like porosity, um, um, is formed from the structure, you know, like, like I said before, it's got, soil's got sand, silt, and clay. So those are different sizes of particles. Clay is really small. Silt is in between clay and sand. And then, then you got gravel above sand. Um, but in a garden, you're going to tend to have sand, silt, and clay. And a um, good um, mix of those would be about 15% uh, or so of uh, sand and then um, split the difference with the silt and clay. It kind of gets in roughly in towards loam. So it's a nice fluffy mixture and not too much clay, but not too much sand. Um, and then for all those pore spaces, we had the, the slide before where there's 25% air and 25% water. So those are held in the spaces between the soil particles. But there's another component of structure that has to do with the biology. We'll get to that a little later. But um, the microorganisms and plants can um, 
release um, organic fluids, they call it exudates. And those exudates will bind to the soil and make little clumps, little aggregates. And then you start getting space between those aggregates. So it's not just the particle sizes in the soil, but the structure of the soil that develops from the action of, of biology starts making um, different size clumps, they're all called aggregates, and they all have spaces between the aggregates and inside, like a large aggregate, will be made up of smaller aggregates held together. And all of that is more pore space and, and little places for things like um, various sizes like bacteria can hide inside the smallest um, um, aggregate inside the bigger aggregates and they live there and get protected from um, their predators. Then color, you know, mostly the color like the reds tell you about presence of iron and White is like silica, and brown and black is start pointing towards um, organic matter. And soil scientists use uh, cards in, or various devices, that, especially like simple cards that had the color on it so that they can use the color in their process of identifying a soil because soil scientists um, create um, a taxonomy of soil they call them soil series, and they they map the soils of an area. The entire United States has got you know map soil maps, and so you can look up and find out what soils at your house if you want. I'll talk about that a little later. But another thing about color: if the color is bright, it tends to say that the soil is dry. Um, if the soil is waterlogged or periodically gets waterlogged, it'll take on a gray cast to even being really gray. So you can, by digging a hole, you can see if you got a place where the water table comes up and then stays there a few, few months and then drops back down, it'll affect the color of the soil. So here's the soil texture, and the texture is basically the mixture of sand, silt, and clay. And this little triangle uh, is pretty standard. And it started like at the, um, like the yeah, on the clay side. Here's clay. Um, so the, the numbers going up, like going up the um, left side is clay, is an increasing amount of clay as you go up. And then from the top down, you got decreasing amount of silt. And then coming across from the bottom, you got an increasing amount of sand. And so in the center of the diagram is where you start getting good loam. And so you would um, come in, up like um, from the sand, you'd be going parallel to the silt side as you, as you go up through this, the diagram with the sand. And then the same with the clay, you'd be going parallel to the bottom. So you see, and then you get the three lines intersecting and you can tell um, what type of soil you have as far as texture. Um, so clay, you know, it holds water really good, but it doesn't let go of water. And it doesn't have um, the air spaces. The air spaces tend to be, be filled with water because the clay holds it so tightly because the clay has got um, a lot of surface area, like a teaspoon full of clay has the surface area of a tennis court. Um, and that surface area has electrical charges and can really hold on to the water. And then sand doesn't hold on to water with a darn. And if you have just uh, sand, you pour water in and it pretty much falls right out the bottom, gets the particles wet, but doesn't, doesn't stay much water in there. Uh, and then silts in between. So 
here again I'm talking about soil structure where the spaces into the voids whether that's between individual mineral grains or between aggregates of grains then you get voids in between that and you get um, empty spaces or spaces where fluid like air or water can move through. Um, so the more volume of air and water in the soil then the more permeable it can become. Uh, like sand is really permeable and clay is not permeable. And you need, you know, a good mixture of air and water for your roots to keep growing and uh, feed the plants. Now here's an idealized um, soils column showing that you got grasses at the top and roots and so the, the hummus up there the humus, I'm sorry, hummus is something I eat and humus is something I grow my food in. Um, and then you get down into the organic layer of the A horizon and then the, and the maybe, so each individual soil has different uh, horizons. Not all of them have the same textbook horizons. Um, if it's a well-developed soil, then it'll have um, these um, horizons and actually the organic layer, the upper layer could actually be broken in a couple of pieces and then um, all the other ones can have sub layers. So the more developed it is, the more complicated the cross section looks. But if you have something that's really simple, like our soil is doesn't have much. There's a few layers, it's like the turf layer and then there's like a little darker color and then starts getting the sand because we live in an area of town that has Nuremberg sand. So there's a, a little bit of organic matter in it and a little bit of silt and clay, but it's more on the sandy side. Okay, keep going. Okay. And then you know, water can flow down through this, and it, but at each of those um, different layers, um, the permeability can change and that can cause the water to go sideways. All right, and biological properties. So we've got all these different organisms from um, microscopic bacteria to earthworms. Um, crawling around and they all have their own different uh, role in what they do to help your soil. So the, the basic idea is, you know, plants grow, they, they die, and then the microorganisms um, recycle all the nutrients in those plants and returns them to the soil and makes them available for your plants. So another healthy teaspoon thing, if you've got good soil with a good um, um, organic community of microbes and other soil organisms, you can have more bacteria, more bac microbes in that soil than there are people on Earth. So it was a heaping teaspoon, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> heaping full of microbes. Yeah. All right, so here's a idea of what the soil food web looks like. Start off with roots and then or like the roots the plants die and then there's uh, organic matter and then the bacteria and the fungi start eating it. And then other things like protozoa and nematodes eat the bacteria and the fungi. And of course there's bacteria that eat other bacteria and fungi that eat bacteria. Um, and then the arthropods, like, like spiders, or arthropods and anthropods, and um, so they keep getting uh, the level further and further up until you get birds starting to eat the worms. Seeing those robins pull the worms right out of the ground, okay? You know, some that's really interesting that's only developed in the last to say 30 years is an understanding of the importance of mycorrhiza and the mycorrhizal net. Um, 
So there's a woman in British Columbia who's been studying this for her entire professional life. Um, and she um, has been known for the development of what they call the wood wide web. <laughs> and that uh, mycorrhiza are essentially filaments that grow between f fungi. You know, so they're a part of the fungi, the, f the fungal component, to, and they form like long filaments in the soil. You might see them digging up old organic matter. You might see white um, traces in it. That's mycorrhiza. And what she found is that mycorrhiza develop associations with plant roots, and that the mycorrhiza can bring nutrients to a tree from a great distance. So the, um, one of the major ways a forest tree lives is this association of mycorrhizae of fungi penetrating or being near. There's different, different ways the association can happen. So some of them go into the plant root, some of them stop right next to the plant root. And there's an exchange between the fungus and the plant. And in a simplified version, the plant says, hey, fungus, I would like some um, magnesium. I don't have enough magnesium. And the fungi goes, OK, I'll trade you some magnesium for sugar. And they do this little interchange. Um, and her work has shown that um, other trees can support each other through this network. But so, and it applies to our house, I mean, uh, plants we have around our yard, but it takes at least six weeks to develop a mycorrhizal network between a plant and, and um, mycorrhiza in the soil. So, Things that are, have a short rotation, like some of your vegetable crops, aren't going to have a mycorrhizal horizon. But other things that are there of a longer growing season, they can develop mycorrhiza and get fed by the fungi. So interesting to go right into till or not to till when we're talking about cutting into the earth and what that might do. So we've talked a lot about soil being an alive organi organism and it's full as we know by looking at it full of fungi full of worms and microbes and the roots of plants um, communicate with each other as Dennis just said and encourage each other so here's a little summarization of till or no till <coughs> In the till, it's an easy, fast setup, start up. Um, that is, if it's dry enough, right? Because you have to wait till it's dry. And no till has a slower setup because you're not cutting into the soil with no till. And in the till, it breaks up the soil. In the no till, it leaves the soil as it is because you're working from the top. In the till, you mix in the amendments. In the no-till, the amendments stay on the top and feed from top down. And the till destroys that soil structure that we've just been talking about because you're cutting down into it. You're cutting down through all of that network um, that has been established. You're, you're turning it over and exposing it, and you're killing the life that's in the soil. It doesn't happen right away, but it does happen. And this is part of the problem with our um, commercial agriculture, is that it, they go in and till the whole thing. The soil dies, so then what do they have to do? They have to fertilize it. Um, tilling reduces the soil moisture. So you know it turns, it turns this furrow over and exposes it to the sun, and it dries it out. In the no-till, it increases water retention because you're adding more organic matter. 
in the till, you bring the weeds and the weed seeds up to the surface. So if you notice, when you till, um, if you let it sit for a while, all of a sudden these, these weeds pop up. Or you plant your garden, and then all of a sudden your garden's full of weeds. In the no-till, um, it utilizes a mulching process, because it's all done from the top. Nothing's dug under. Um, and so the weeds, if they, if they show up, you know, the weed seeds are everywhere, they're really easy to just pull out by hand. You don't have to do a lot of digging. Um, with tilling, you're starting from square one every year because you till the whole thing, right? And so there's nothing there. But with no-till, um, you're increasing that health every year because you keep adding to the top of it. The, the till increases erosion, as we said, because you're cutting through the soil, you're breaking that structure down, you're, in, you're, you're exposing it to the elements, there's more erosion. But with the no-till, because you keep adding on, you don't have that erosion factor. As I said before, the till, you, you need to have fertilizers because you've killed, you've killed so much of the nutrients in the soil. So, um, Rita, yes. is that the same with raised beds or garden boxes? No, because you, well, if you're tilling in that box, yes. Yeah, you shouldn't dig it all up, you should add. And there stuff. really is no need to dig it up because you're, you're putting soil into that. Right? Yeah. You shouldn't have to till. What would you use the mulch you know, when you say mulching? We're going to go through a, a, a slide that shows how that layering is done. But mulching can be anything from um, dead plants. So there, in permaculture, there's uh, a process called chop and drop, so where you, um, you take a plant that's, that's done. And instead of pulling that plant up, you just chop it off at the soil surface and you lay it down. And then it decomposes. You can use wood chips, you can use straw, you can use um, hay, um, you can use cover crops. So some kind of cover crops like clover or um, a perennial. And you just plant down in the, per in the perennial ground cover. So it, you, the main thing is that you want to keep the, the, the um, soil covered because when you keep it covered, it holds in the moisture, it holds in the nutrients. Okay. Um, tilling turns the soil back to dirt, basically. And in the no-till, it retains that diverse ecosystem that we were talking about. Well, I wouldn't use grass no. because grass doesn't serve a useful purpose, really. I mean, if you, if you have a cover crop, so something that can feed the soil, the grass does not feed the soil. Okay. It takes away from the soil. Yeah, so I would use a cover crop. Something, you know, it doesn't even have to be short. A cover crop could be like oats that you would sow in the fall and let them stay in in the bed all winter and feed and then it just falls over in the spring and basically decomposes. Okay. So retire the rototiller and the plow and let nature do the work. It really does. We'll show you in a minute. Um, regenerative agriculture goes beyond sustainability. You know, everybody talks about sustainability, which is great, but Regenerative agriculture actually practices rehabilitating the soil, which is what we really need. If, if the soil is, de if, is depleting at the rate that we heard, then what we need to do is start regenerating it. So why, when, and how to make the soil? So regenerating the soil by enriching, enriching it, enhancing and tending to it so that it can feed your plants and ultimately feed your family. So we've been talking 
a lot about soil being a living organism. If you're not familiar with any of Michael Pollan's work, I highly recommend that you, he has a lot of YouTube videos and he's, he's really easy to listen to. And here's, this is what he says, soil is a living miracle that we rely on for 95% of what we eat. For years we have depleted this life giving soil. One way of conquering climate change is more photosynthesis and returning carbon back into the soil. So, how often do you eat? A lot, a lot right? <laughs> so, we need to feed the soil. And the way to feed the soil is from the top. So, think of, think of the top of your soil as the mouth of the soil. Just waiting for all that, all the, to be given to it and it will take it down into the soil. It knows what to do. You just have to give it the right elements and the right conditions. So here is a way to create your soil. Now it takes time to do this. That's why we said that tilling you can plant faster, probably. Um, and this me method takes a little bit longer, but you won't be sorry. We've done it, and it was amazing the difference from last year when we first started creating this lasagna method to now what we have in our soil. So here's the process. There's seven points. And then over here is, are the layers. So first of all, you want to decide where your location of your garden is going to be, um, whether that's out on the soil or in a raised bed. You can do this in a raised bed too. And you want to make sure that any weeds or grass are down as far as you can get them. And then you put a single layer or a double layer of cardboard. So you want cardboard that's clean. It doesn't have any printing on it, any color on it, no labels, no tape, no staples. So that takes a while. Get your kids involved in, or your grandkids involved in doing that. And then you want to lay it down. And why I say a double layer is that, you know, the boxes have the, the, the tops when you flatten it all out. And you want to make sure that you cover up those, those splits from the top of the box, right? So sometimes you have to double layer it. And make sure you water it thoroughly. You really want the cardboard to be completely soaked through. So you might want to just do a little section and then do another little section because you want to keep it wet. And then comes the layering, just like making lasagna, only it's making soil lasagna. And then here are the, here are the, the different um, layers. So here's your ground. So your grass, you know, if you have grass, it'd be right here. Here's your cardboard. Then you can start with leaves a layer of leaves, and then a layer of grass clippings, if you have them, or seaweed. I mean, we are so lucky here to be close to where there's seaweed. And you can go to the, to the beaches and get seaweed. Take, take five-gallon buckets or a big tote and bring the seaweed home and layer that. Then a layer of some kind of mulch. We just talked about mulches. And you don't have to use veggie scraps if you don't have them, you can, if your veggie scraps are already in your compost, then just use the compost. And manure, some kind of manure. And then you start layering again. Grass clipping, seaweed, straw, and hay, veggie scraps, and mulch. And more grass clippings or seaweed on the top. And it takes a while. So that's why we say you have to let it cook. Because nature Nature takes a while to decompose things, but it'll happen pretty fast, especially if you keep it moist. Um, so you should let it sit for three to six months. But if you want to get your plants right in, you can add six inches of a good compost on the top of all that and plant your little seedlings. But you have to have a good six inches. We found out the hard way last year. We didn't have quite have six inches. and um, some of our roots kind of started to cook because this will this will get pretty hot so you have to make sure you have a good six inches and don't plant something like tomatoes in there because you know tomatoes need 
be planted deep. And you will have, by the next year, a beautiful thick layer of, of good soil. So every year you keep doing the same thing because you have all those things, right? You need some place to put them. You're not going to take them anywhere. So you just keep adding to it and you just keep getting richer and richer and richer soil. Okay, soil health practices. Okay, here are some uh, good health practices for your soil. And basically you're supporting that living ecosystem. So you really want to respect your soil and everything you do with it. One of the things I just want to mention real quickly is um, making sure that you have walking paths between your rows or around your raised bed and you're not walking on that soil because it, help, it compacts it. And you really want to have that, that springiness to the soil because it's alive. So, so think about that when you're planning out your garden and how you're going to do it because you want to make sure that you're walking on what isn't planted and you're leaving the live soil alone and not walking on it. Okay. So you have the organic matter, the living nutrients, the compost, the seaweed, cover crops, the chop and drop as I was talking about, and the mulches. Um, so on the top, once you get your garden planted, you want to make sure that you have a good layer of some kind of mulch on the top. Um, mulching does a number of things. It helps to keep the moisture down in. It helps to keep the weeds at bay. And um, it actually continues to feed the soil. Protection, just what I was just saying. Uh, reduce your compaction, keep your soil covered. And then diversity is a really important piece. And we've heard about this crop rotation. You know that you shouldn't have the same things in the same place every year in the same soil because it depletes. Um, there can be diseases and pathogens and things in the soil. And if, if you put the same thing back in, you could have a greater incidence of, of diseases. Using cover crops, as I said. So. It, it's fall time, you're done for the year, your crops are finished. If you sow something like oats across your bed, it'll feed it throughout the winter. And as I said, then in the summer, oats are one of those things you don't even have to cut it down. It'll just, it just falls over and it just sort of melts into the ground in the spring. And then intercropping. So say you have, uh, well, let's say you have a row of beans you can have a row of something else in between those plants. They can be companion plants, they could be some other crop. But what you want to do is keep that surface area of the soil covered. So doing intercropping helps, helps with that. So why is the diversity so important? Because soil in itself is the most important and biologically diverse part of our ecosystem and it needs to be fed. When we combine many plant species together, they have a beneficial relationship one with another. Think about the woods when you go into the woods. This is why f food forest gardening is, is so um, successful. And it's because you have your big tall trees in the forest. Then you have you know, the tall canopy, then you have a shorter canopy. And then you've got shrubs. And then you've got herbaceous plants and then you've got some vines and you've got some ground cover and that's all growing synergistically together in the forest. So that's uh, what creates plant diversity. Things grow better, you have a higher yield, they're more nutritious because they have all of those minerals and vitamins and things in it present in the soil. The soil is what's giving it to them. It resists pets and pests and diseases, and those plants are much more resilient. You have a lot less um, morbidity. So this is a, also a very sobering statement that came from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
The nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. But the good news is, is that it's up to us. We can do it. We can change that around. So the takeaways are that agriculture plays an integral role in preserving biodiversity by regenerating the soil health. That's the key, regeneration, regeneration, regeneration. Our whole ecosystem depends on billions of interactions between soil and living organisms. Monocropping has depleted the world's soils of vital nutrients. That's why they have to put so much fertilizer on the soil. But biodiversity is a complex and crucial part of nature because of the impact it has on plants, animals, and humans. And we as home gardeners can use these practices to grow our own nutritious fresh food. Fresh food. So let's start building some soil. Questions? I have a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, Last year you put the cardboard in the layers, then you did that again this year? Not or yet, not yet. But you will. Um, uh, and there are areas where that layers. cardboard has, has completely dissolved, and we will, we will add cardboard again. And it has to be six inches? That the layering should be six inches? Um, six it doesn't inches? have to be the second year. It can be what, whatever you have. Um, you mean if you're going to plant right away? Right. Yes, yes on top of it, yes. You can pull the cardboard away. You could cut a hole in the cardboard, but it's still gonna, it's still gonna be de degrading, so um, it, could get, it could get warm, depending on what you're planting. So if we were to get seaweed, do we have to get it like grass clippings or just lay it? Lay Say that again? No, you layer it. You could just layer it. And if you're keeping it moist enough by the layering, um, it, it just disintegrates. It creates, it creates the layers as it decomposes. You keep all of this well saturated. It doesn't have to be saturated, but it shouldn't be dry. Any, um, any guidelines on using compost and manures? I know you should never use fresh manure. You should be composted. Well, if you're using it in the, in the lasagna method, you could use fresh because you're not going to, you're not going to be going that far down into the soil especially if you're going to let it sit. Because this process of layering is going to help it decompose pretty fast. Yeah, so the, um, the reason you don't use fresh manure is that it's got a, a relatively high nitrogen load and it feeds the bacteria. And the bacteria start really processing and it gets warm. And that warmth um, gets can get too hot and injure the plant roots. So you don't want to use fresh manure because you can d damage the roots of the plants. But in this method, you're letting it sit there for a while and it's decomposing. By the time you plant in that particular material, it'll have cooled down and won't be a problem. There mm. are some manures that are cooler. So um, llama, alpaca, um, sheep, bunny. Those are cooler, cooler manures. But horse, chicken, um, that, those, those are, and cow manure are, are really hot manures. Sharon, did you have a question? Oh, yes. Um, when you talk about mulch on the top, what's the, t this is how little I know, what's the difference like, why is it different than loam? Well, so, so okay. mm -hmm. um, on a technical level, I mean, there's, I want to separate, there's common speech. 
and some people just call anything that's dark as loam, okay? A soil scientist um, only calls things in, are loam if it falls in that little region on that triangle that I showed you that has, so it has a specific mix of sand, silt, and clay. Now mulch is going to be, be some, typically an organic matter, so there's no sand, silt, or clay in it. Um, so, you know, you might, like wood chips would be a, a mulch, or um, dried leaves, or um, straw. straw, you know, so those are typical things that you use for a mulch. So you should put that on the top? The very the top. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, in, in besides mulch, you know, and then the cover crop, mm -hmm. well, one of the forms of compaction it protects against is rainfall. So rain hits the soil with a lot of force. And, you know, you can find slow motion videos probably on YouTube of soil particles scattering all over when the raindrop hits. And, oh, uh, I forgot the exact number, half inch, inch down into the soil, a layer, a compacted layer will form. So if you leave your soil ex surface exposed to rainfall, it'll diminish its ability to absorb water because this compacted layer a little bit below the surface is there. If you look at a, a house that doesn't have any plants around it, uh, you can see where the rain splashed down and hit the soil and it splashes up on the foundation. So you can see that it moves it moves that far. Yeah, um, so last year the garden was really productive and we got a lot of wonderful fruit out of it, but the volunteers were having to water like every day because the, the soil got really hard mm -hmm. and dry. Yeah, so, so I think that was the key. It, we the key, it really is mulching. It's yeah. amazing the difference that you'll yeah. see when you have a nice layer of some sort of mulch on the top. It, it will keep you from having to water so much. Yeah, the, so the, you, you just directly saw what happens when you water and it dries out, water dry it out, why isn't dry? It forms that crust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yes. If you have a raised garden box, say three or four feet long, uh, at approximately what level would you, if you had some manure or if you had some seaweed or whatever, do you put it on the top? Do you put it midway or what? You put it on top of the soil. Even, even manure and everything? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're wanting to do that this year, mm -hmm. the best time to have done that would have been in the fall. Yeah. yeah. So make your lasagna in the fall. That's the best time to do it. Yeah. When we lived in Oregon and we converted our front yard, which was beautiful, beautiful lawn, um, we converted that into a, uh, a beautiful pollinator garden. We started in the fall with a huge load of alpaca manure. And then we did, well, first the cardboard, of course. And we layered it and layered it and layered it. And by the spring, it was beautiful soil. It's amazing how, you know, how that will happen. Now, it's a very different climate there, too. We didn't have all the snow that you have here. But even the snow helps to, when it starts melting, in the, and all that is working underneath the snow, even though it's cold. So that is the best time. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Um, University of Maine Extension, do they do the um, soil testing? Uh, so so um, they can provide you with a, a soil sample form and a little box to put the soil in. Okay. And then you mail it up to Orno okay. to the Maine Soil Testing Service, which is part of the university. Oh, they're still doing that. Mm -hmm. still yeah. That's what is we that use. the only place you can go? I mean, is that like the standard 
Well, that's the place we used, but um, I think you could probably send it off to the University of New Hampshire if you wanted, or, and uh, or friend, to Vermont. A friend of mine that's uh, down in New Hampshire swears by Cornell, so she sends hers to Cornell. I don't know exactly why, but she, she likes them, so that's who she uses. So there's various places you can use. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know about Maine, because you know, Maine's not a large agricultural um, comparison, like in Oregon and California, where I'm from, um, you know, agriculture is really big business. And so there are um, private soil testing labs, you know, but here, I, I don't know whether it would be the business to support them. So. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you coming. If you didn't sign, uh, sign this list, if I have things to send out to you, yeah. this is how I would send it. So, Either websites where we would have links yeah. or handouts. Yeah, so one thing we can send you is a link to the um, Natural Resources, excuse me, the Natural Resources Conservation Service website. Yeah. And they have a tool that they call web soil so you can like put in your address and it'll take you to your house and it'll show you what kind of soil um, you have it's not the, mm, the simplest interface to use but you play with it a little bit you'll figure it out and mm -hmm. it's just kind of yeah. interesting to see and you can see what's around you um, Here's, this is not necessarily having to do with soil, but certainly having to do with your garden. And if you don't know about MAFCA, do you know who MAFCA is? It's the Maine Organic Farmers and Growers Association, a gardening association. We joined it because they, they have so much information. This is a great document that tells um, the times of the year and what seeds to start planting. So I'll send this off to you. And this article is really interesting, and it's, it's, it's a little, little late, but um, you may have heard in the news about how gardening is so good for your health and for your mental health. They have done studies that have shown that by having your, your hands down in the dirt, it actually stimulates the good feeling hormones in your body, makes you healthier, makes you happier. Not only are you outside, you know, in the fresh air and, and enjoying yourself, but just working in the soil uh, is really beneficial to your health. So here's a, um, an article from uh, the Royal College of Physicians about gardening for health, a regular dose of gardening, which I can send out to you. It's a little technical, but it's really good information. So that's one of the things I can send. Do you want us to re-sign